2020, they uh, they did a tactical. They were able to confirm that the that the grid could withhold the the, the traffic by removing lanes on those green axes, uh, and then they went ahead and did the the, the tactical uh, intervention. And in fact, this this on the right here is is the very beginning of the one we just saw, and you can see with the vegetation grown out, it looks even much nicer. Uh, that was really the beginning. Uh, there it is. It looks much nicer. Yeah. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. My name is John Zimmerman, and that is Jordi Honey Rosas from Barcelona. And we are going to be talking about these super blocks there in Barcelona and uh, a few other fun things. Uh, let's get right to it with Jordi. Jordi, thank you so much for joining me in the Active Towns podcast. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Jordi, I love giving my guests just an opportunity to you know, share with the audience just a little bit about uh, yourself. Uh, so who the heck is Jordi? Okay, well, um, so I'm a research professor at the Institute of Environmental Science and Technology at the Autonomous University of Barcelona. And I'm an urban planner uh, by training. And I've been here in Barcelona for about three years. And it's just been a joy to uh, lead a research team on the transformations taking place in Barcelona. And now to have the chance to share some of that, uh, some of that work, some of what we've been studying, and I'd really like to talk about the superblocks because I think that's a, a transformation that has received a lot of attention uh, from around the world, and it's been uh, it's been really a joy to work closely with those who led that transformation and and talk a little bit about it because it's an inspiring story for sure. Fantastic. That's great. Tell us a little bit about your journey. Uh, how did you make your way to Barcelona? I mean, I don't get the sense that you're originally from there, but maybe you are. Yeah. Good question. So I, I grew up in California. I grew up into the Silicon Valley. and uh, But my mother is Catan. My mother is from this region. So I spoke the language and uh, I have family here. So I had, I had a reason to come when I was invited to, to make the make the, the, the transfer the change from Vancouver. I was in the planning school in Vancouver for eight years and uh, teaching in the master's program there was wonderful uh, accredited program both in Canada and in the, in the United States. And the opportunity came up to come to Barcelona and I took it. Fantastic. Yeah. I'm going to pull up your LinkedIn page actually right now, just because, you know, you and I have been connected for a while out on LinkedIn and you spend a fair amount of time doing that. And as I was looking at this, I'm like, oh, wait, Dude's from Northern California, just like me. <laughs> so okay. I grew yeah. up uh, I, right along the I-80 corridor in a little town called Lincoln. I say little town because when I lived there, Lincoln was all of about 4,000 people. And I grew up on a ranch outside of the city. But of course, uh, you know, when I graduated from high school, a lot of my peers either went to Davis or to Berkeley, uh, up to Chico State. Um, I decided to go to, uh, you know, one of your arch rivals down, uh, you know, cause you were at UC Berkeley. Uh, I went down to USC. And so I did my undergrad at USC before moving on to Michigan for my master's. So yeah. So you, you grew up in the Bay area and then went to Berkeley. Yeah. And I went to Berkeley and, uh, spent time living in, in Mexico in the, in the Midwest in the East coast, then in Canada. And I love the Bay area, but as an urban planner, I now cringe because there's, there's so much talent in the Bay Area. There's so much intellect, there's so much wealth, there's so much vision for the future in terms of technology. And yet in how spaces and cities are designed, it's, it's years behind. Um, and so there's this contrast between uh, a place with vision and forward thinking, and yet there's still a lot of work to be done in, in making the, the city safer and ready for active travel and inclusive and all the things that, that we want to happen. So that's, that's an interesting, interesting story about the Bay area. Um, lots of potential. Of course, I know that I know they're working hard and they're doing, they're making progress. Um, but you know, I was in Vancouver for eight years and Van and Vancouver is a city that's done a lot in, uh, also West coast, uh, has a great transportation system has, you know, 9% of, of commuter trips are, uh, by bike which is wonderful for North American standards. And, uh, and they're, they're taking advantage of every space of land to densify. So it can be done in a North American, in a North American context. Uh, and it'd be great to see the Bay Area um, make those bold, bold changes as well. Yeah, no, I'm really glad you mentioned that too. Um, 
I, I, I've, I'm going to have an opportunity to make it back to the Bay Area and do uh, some more profiles of that area. But you're absolutely right. I mean, it has a long legacy, especially Berkeley has a long legacy of some of the leading, you know, some of the thought leaders in this arena. But yeah, I mean, other than some like early 1970s sort of traffic calming innovations, especially right in the city of Berkeley, it, it, they really have a car brain mentality now, and it's really difficult to get things done, even though the on campus, you know, there's some thought leaders there. Um, you know, I'm thinking of, of, of folks, too, who live right in that area, like Dan Paralek with um, Opticos uh, is based out of there and has done some wonderful things like the uh, the cul-de-sac car free or car car light neighborhood down in Tempe, Arizona. Uh but and then a long legacy, like with Donald Appleyard, who was right there in, in in the Berkeley area. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. There's there's certainly, there's certainly some some great some great leaders there, and uh, but there's there's the context that they're working in is is difficult. So it'd be it'll be interesting to see how how it how it how it progresses in the next few years. Yeah. Well, and 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 Berkeley itself, as as a place since you're you're kind of from that that Bay Area. It's kind of fun to see, and I had this conversation with uh, John Bowders, the mayor of Emeryville. Um, when he was the mayor there, he's I think he's termed out of the mayor, but he he was we were talking about the fact that he's moving quickly to try to make it the streets more people oriented and pushing the envelope and maybe even kind of shaming Berkeley for not, you know, keeping up with Emeryville of all places. Yeah, no, he's done great work there. I've been following him, and uh, and and he's an excellent communicator. Uh, yeah, no, it's, I would love, I'd love to go there and, and see see those transformations because I haven't I haven't been there since I since I was spent my time in, in Berkeley. Um, and I'm also there's I don't know if you've ever connected with uh, Luke Bornheimer, who's in San Francisco. He's an activist, and uh, he's also working on several campaigns. He did the bike bus in. Uh, and San Francisco also working on, you know, car free, uh, JFK, um, and several other initiatives, no turn on red. So there's, there's, there's definitely things, uh, a conversation taking place and, uh, a new mayoral election. Um, so we'll, so we'll see how that, how that turns out. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, uh, since you just uh, mentioned to Luke, let's pull up his uh, landing page for, for that episode. Uh, that was actually uh, episode 220 in season six. And I had both Roger and Luke on. And yeah, we sure did. We talked about some of the challenges uh, that are happening there. And quite frankly, having a frank discussion about how, uh, you know, some of the infrastructure challenges, like they, they take a good step forward and then come up with a really, you know, harebrained idea. We also had some really good stuff that uh, uh, Clarence Eckerson from Street Films had shot there. And so we profiled some of his work uh, on his most recent visit. I also wanted to, to bring up the fact that, yeah, um, I did have an opportunity to interview uh, Dale Bracewell way back in uh, season three of uh, the podcast. Yeah, we really talked about his legacy there at the city um, in Vancouver of really trying to move things forward. And we really talked about the fact that he felt that, you know, we needed to move forward with much more of a sense of urgency because he just didn't feel like the cities were being authentic about the true challenge that climate change is presenting. And, you know, he was there for quite some time. And, and a lot of the good stuff that you just mentioned about Vancouver, uh, you know, he was at the helm and was really trying to push those things forward. And he just basically got to the point where, you know, he moved on and is, is doing other things with foresight. But, yeah, really felt like we needed to move more quickly and with more of a sense of urgency. That's that's interesting you say that, because um, when I came to Barcelona, I did get the sense that there is a that there is a sense of urgency from the residents, the cycling community, the safe streets community, the, 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 those who are involved in safe streets for kids. Um, so I, I really have have had that sense. And in fact, the chief architect of Barcelona's transformations in the last four years um, does talk about that sense of urgency of, um, you know, with, you know, climate change, changing the temperatures that we'll, we'll see in the summer here in Barcelona, um, the air quality issues, um, you know, adapting to, to climate change. Those issues are really leading the, the, uh, the transformations that we've seen. 
um, in the last few years. And that's been great. And maybe, maybe the uh, sense of urgency in the Bay Area or in California, they're thinking about other, you know, you know, technological changes and they just don't have the bandwidth to, to think about their physical, their physical space. Um, but yes, it's interesting. I'm glad to get that here that Dale uh, was, was talking about that because I definitely have sensed that as a key ingredient for, uh, for making changes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's stop beating around the bush. Let's talk super blocks. <laughs> I'm going to uh, pull up just a little video here that, you know, kind of is a little literal introdu- introduction to this. Uh, so what the heck is a Barcelona super block? Well, it's, it's an evolving idea. It's uh, an idea that captured um, a lot of attention um, about 10 years ago when in the city plan, they um, anticipated scaling super blocks across the entire city um, as being uh, spaces that pedestrianize or pedestrian priority spaces in which vehicles could still go, 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 go through, but it's not through cut traffic, you know, cut through traffic. Um, unless you had a destination in that street, you have no reason to, to go there. And, but the idea has been evolving. And uh, I think the planners have been really good at taking the basic ideas behind Superbox of um, adding in green spaces, you know, prioritizing play spaces and uh, prior, prioritizing people. But it's, it's evolved in a lot of different forms. And here what we're seeing is one of the, the, tactic, one of the earlier tactical inter- uh, interventions when I, when I walk people through the streets, I like to try to show that evolution of the idea because it really has evolved. I, I talk about Superbox as being uh, really an experiment that prioritizes people. And, and, and I use that word experiment intentionally, right? An experiment that learns and then adapts and uh, d- develops new designs. Yeah. So um, it's, it's, again, Got a lot of attention. There was this, uh, you know, David Roberts did a wonderful article uh, from Vox. He did it also. Uh, There's also a video on Vox that really put it into the spotlight. And its most recent iteration has, you know, t- taken out several lanes of traffic and turned them into uh, pedestrian corridors for over three kilometer, three kilometer stretch that uh, that crosses the entire city. Wow. Okay. So, and that, that's a that's a little bit of a departure from our original sort of concept because the original concept was a nine block grid, hence the super block. And then the interior, those streets interior were these more people oriented places, ultra low speeds, if any speeds at all. Um, and, and as you mentioned, I'm going to hit play on this one more time, the lighter, quicker, cheaper materials in this first iteration of more of a tactical urbanism approach, um, because you could like, you could deploy this really, really quickly. Right, right, right. So they, they started with several tactical interventions. It's actually, this is tactical version 2.0. There was, there was, um, there was even more tactical, even lower cost uh, iterations in other, in other places um, in the city in earlier experiments. You have to remember that what we're seeing here, for example, this was a vehicle intersection, right? So there's no people in this space whatsoever, right? So it's a square that's... Um, that's been generated. This is the one of the the, the more most hardscape squares. In fact, that has the least amount of green space. But it was done for purposefully so. Um, that they do a farmers market in this space. They um, uh, have you know civic meetings. They have you know neighborhood meetings and such. But this was a vehicle intersection uh, just two years ago. And Barcelona is looking to its intersections, its vehicle intersections, as it's the new place for its green spaces because it, it simply uh, doesn't have a lot of green spaces. That's one of the fewest amount of green spaces per capita. Um, it has uh, heavy air pollution and noise pollution in the, in the center of the city because of these, uh, these vehicles. And the strategy has been to, to rethink these, these streets entirely um, to provide green space and a uh, place for gathering. One thing I like about this video is you can see lots of elderly and age diversity here, uh, which, is, which is great, you know, you, you, you know grandparents and, kids and uncles and aunts and neighbors. And it, it's really a space for people to come together when, again, this was just dominated by, by parked vehicles uh, just two years ago. Yeah. So it, it and moving vehicles, I'm assuming. Yeah, both. Yeah. What I love about this particular video in comparison to the earlier video and for the listening only audience, um, you know, what we're looking at now is 
clearly a little bit more permanent infrastructure. This is clearly not a quick build sort of just tra- sort of traffic calming and, and traffic diversion. Now we're talking about trees that have been planted. As you just mentioned, there's a little bit more hardscape to accommodate those the, the market approach to it. But we do see a greening to this area here. So bringing that heat island effect down a little bit by making sure that we get some trees in there that will eventually have a shade canopy, but also just help bring that temperature of of this environment down as we're dealing with more extreme temperatures. Yeah. And there's there's also a stormwater element to this uh, intervention. In fact, it's it's underground. You can't even see it. It's one of the most expensive pieces, but they actually dug up all the soils and they ensured that they were able to connect the, the stormwater so that it would it would provide water for the vegetation and the trees that were planted. Um, and again, a really expensive, um, really expensive part of the project that's not not well well appreciated. Yeah, and I want to do an overhead view here too, and and just be able to to appreciate what you're talking about here, you know, at, at tree level, <laughs> being able to look down on that environment and the permeability of some of those pavers too. Yeah, yeah. Here, here. This is a, you get a little bit of a sense of the the classical Barcelona intersection. Which, um, if you're familiar with a little bit of urban planning history, you might know that the word urbanism was coined by a by a by a planner here from Barcelona called Serra. He was the first to use the word urbanism. Until then, was, um, urban planning was mostly dominated by architects. But he was an engineer, and he was um, commissioned to develop what was called the extension plan in the 1850s that would connect the old city with the surrounding towns of Barcelona. And he created the, the iconic chamfered corners or cut corners. So if you look at that corner there, basically it's like a, it's like an inner, it's like a, it's a regular square that has a, a, a cut corner at a 45 degree angle, creating very large uh, intersections. And he did that with the idea of anticipating the fast moving vehicles. Trains, trains had just been, was the new technology of the 1850s. And as an engineer, he wanted to create intersections that create a lot of visibility so that fast moving vehicles could go by. What he didn't anticipate in his, uh, in his block design was that vehicles would clog these spaces, right? And what happened is that vehicles move straight through the intersection, but pedestrians have to go around in this chamfered, in this cut corner. And so it's very inconvenient for, for pedestrians. And what the super block design has done is invert that in which now uh, pedestrians go straight and cars actually go go around. So those those intersections have been have been rethought with the, you know with the purpose of pedestrians and, and green space um, first in mind and and inviting cars as as guests essentially. Yeah, I want to uh, pop into your 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 presentation here for just a moment because I I love this in- intro slide because it also gives an overhead, you know, go even going even higher from a bird's eye view of kind of what these blocks, uh, the building blocks and, and all of this looks like. Um, walk us through some of that challenge because we're talking about a fairly dense city, but it's, it's not a city of high rises necessarily. And it's also a city where um, back in the good old days or the bad old days, cars kind of dominated many of these streets. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. But Barcelona is one of the, the cities that has the, the most cars per, per capita um, in Europe. Um, a, a lot, a lot of the, the, there's a tremendous amount of vehicles moving through the city as well. Um, and, um, and, and it's creating all sorts of, all sorts of issues, air pollution problems, um, noise, um, you know, traffic safety, a lot of the issues that I'm sure you and your, or your listeners are familiar with. And um, uh, maybe we could go, maybe we could go to those slides and I can, I can walk you through some of the, 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 the motivation factors that led to the super block problem. Uh, yeah, uh, transformation. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, let's, uh, let's, so as let's I mentioned, here. yeah, there's uh in the city, there's an absence of green space, especially in the extension uh, district. So unlike other cities that have large parks, uh, Barcelona doesn't, doesn't have any. And so that's why they're looking to their streets as their, their one place where they need to add, add in green. Um, maybe next slide. Another issue has been um, uh, air quality. So Barcelona has been in, in compliance with um, air quality standards from the EU. And in fact, they've been fined uh, because they haven't met uh, EU air quality standards. 
Um, there's also been a lot of research that have been linking poor air quality with cognitive development of ch- in children. Uh, and so there's there's a ma- major concern about the impacts in, in internal learning learning abilities for for children. So air quality has been a major major driver. What's the what's the environment like from um, from like a uh, you and I both have Northern California in common. Um, I have visited uh, uh, Seville before. I know that that's like much further south. Very very hot environment there. Uh, you mentioned the air quality issue. Um, previously, I've lived in Boulder, Colorado, and Denver area. We oftentimes get sort of a uh, uh, an air quality issue uh, both in the winter and sometimes in the summer. Uh, what's what are the conditions that are exacerbating uh, the air quality issue in addition just to the polluting cars? Is there also a, a top, topography uh, challenge that's happening too? So to some extent, there's the there's the mountains behind Barcelona, although it's a, it's a coast it's a coastal city, uh, but there are mountains that are that are that are behind it. There's the port and the airport, which are which are very close to the the city center. So that's also a part of it. And uh, the air quality is worse in the winter when there's this thermal inversion that uh, keeps the the air, air at the you know within the city. It's kind of like Salt Lake City then, yeah. Right. Right, so that's that's typical. Um, in the in the summer, you know, you'll have you'll have the the, the breeze, you know, with the hot air rising uh, inland, and then pulling in the, the the sea breeze. But you don't get that in the winter, so you have very poor, very very poor air quality during the winter. And it was interesting, you know, talking to to the planners and the activists who had been pushing for the superblock idea for a long time. It really was the air quality and health arguments that were the most compelling to bring uh, the public around and bring this, the city leaders around to, to invest into transforming their, their streets. It wasn't the climate change arguments. And it certainly is part of the, which was just, was just what, you, what you see here. I mean, it's definitely part, you know, in a front in mind in some of the city planners, but in terms of communicating with the public, it was largely the public health argument that, uh, and, and, and related in the largest thing to children that um, we, you know, we're, we're hurting our, our children's ability to develop and ability to learn. We have, uh, and we're in compliance. The EU regulations also took, you know, ha- had, uh, had an effect, you know, for the, for the city to not be in compliance with minimum air quality standards carried, carried a lot of weight uh, and saying we have, to, we have to change how, we're, how we organize our, our city. So, yeah, so that was, that was a big, big motivation in, in, in getting the super blocks off the ground, which had been around for a long time. Well, before before we go to to this next kind of overview of the road hierarchy and what that super block really looks like, because we we described it, you know, sort of audibly here, but I want to get a visual. But I want to linger just a little bit more on the fact that climate change is an issue. We we talked about it a little bit in terms of the sense of urgency need to move forward and all of that. Uh, we even talk a little bit. You just mentioned public health. One of the things that as a public health professional myself, you know, somebody who's been working in public health uh, for the last 34 years, I know that even that message doesn't resonate as um, as profoundly as conversations of around, well, what can you do for me today in terms of quality of life? And what, you know, and well-being, you know, more of a, a short-term public health perspective, like, uh, like from that perspective versus a long-term public health perspective of, you know, preventing, you know, cancer and preventing heart disease down the road. It's like, well, what can you do for me lately? And I think that's one of the beautiful things of this design of being able to create places that are able to transform profoundly the environment, the block, the intersection. And you can, as a resident of that area, you can see right away, oh, this is so much better. This is so much higher of a quality of life. And then you start looking at, oh yeah, okay, this, this impacts mental health, physical health. It, it, it addresses the climate change. It addresses the public health and and all of that altogether. In other words, it's not, we're not, we're not trying to sell something on one thing, like just climate change. Right. It's, there are all these other additional benefits, right? The geeky term is the co-benefits, right? You, there are all these other, you know, not only do you have a, a safer street when you walk out your front door, 
you also have a place to, to, you know, to take your grandmother when you, when you see her in the afternoon or you take her out a public square or a place for, for kids to play. Um, and, and it's also quieter and you have better air quality and you're meeting all these other, other objectives. Um, absolutely. And, and, and that, you know, this, this, this is the, 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 the conventional model, right? Where you have these neighborhood units, these squares, you have, you'll notice the small arrows on the green, uh, segment, we'll, you know, we'll move, they'll allow vehicle movement. So it's not that um, cars are 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 eliminated entirely, um, but what, what by allow by moving cars around, you don't have the through traffic. And then notice those four intersections there, uh, in which you can rethink those spaces entirely. Uh, and, and that's and that's that that's been the great opportunity to create the the green spaces or the civic spaces in the in the super block model and. And and from this adi- an original model, the idea has been has been evolving, and I and I really commend the the planners for not not insisting on just sticking to this this uh, entirely, and and thinking about how they can quickly um, implement the the this uh, sh- street calming, uh, pedestrian priority street design in in m- as many streets as possible in the city. Yeah, when was the first? implementation of uh, of the super nia the super block so in 2016 is when they uh, they began it in the grid um there were a street calming or traffic uh, management um strategies in uh neighborhoods that had old cities were sort of old city street designs right in which they you know they they reoriented traffic outside so that the the old city would you know, would be walkable, but I feel that things really began when they worked in the in the in the rational grid, and I think this is more relevant to planners in North America as well, because the you know the Europeans have been getting rid of vehicles in uh, old cities for years and pedestrianizing old middle streets, and that's almost easy, right? That's almost too easy. Clearly, cars don't belong there, and and I've heard planners say, well, well, what about a North American context? And and I think that's why the super block transformations in the grid are really exciting because. You have street dimensions that are 20 meters from facade to facade. So this grid could be Denver or Austin or uh, San Francisco or right other other. So it's it's much more. Um, it shows. I think what Barcelona Superblocks program shows that you can have radical pedestrianization in sh- street dimensions that are very common in North America and other parts in other parts of the world. And so that's why I think this these most recent iterations are all the more uh, exciting uh, to see. I, I, I zoomed in just so I could uh, help uh, the the viewers uh, see a little bit better what you were talking about with those interior four intersections. Uh, again, this is a nine block grid. Uh, we've we've got the external streets that are still uh, a little speedy. Are they still fifty kilometers per hour, or have they been reduced to thirty kilometers per hour? The the outer streets. So these these in particular uh, have been uh, re- uh, reduced to thirty. So the, and they're, but they're also but the superblock models and en- en- envisions treatment along all sorts of streets. So it's not only about the interior streets. It's also about uh, reducing tra- uh, speeds, uh, adding uh, transit lanes, and 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 rethinking those streets as well. That's a, that's and a what kind of critical. It, what I wanted to emphasize too, thank you for that clarification because it, on the grid here, it, it still shows it in the black. And I was like, oh, I hope it's not still 50 kilometers on those streets uh, because they really should be 30. But the internal green local network, I love it. 10 kilometers per hour is the design speed of those, which makes sense now that when we see some of those video clips that we watched earlier, it's like, yeah, you know, somebody who has a need to get somewhere meaningful in their car can still access that, uh, but it's not a flow through. This is not a place. And you see these arrows and you're like re- literally realizing that the only person who would drive in there is somebody who has a true need to drive a motor vehicle in there. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And and, and, and in the most recent version of the of the super blocks, which 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 has not applied this this grid model, by the way, they they, they applied a, a street coming along a corridor, but they 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 used the the materials of the of the street were actually um, sidewalk material, right? Sidewalk design, 
um, to get to really give the vehicles a sense that uh, they are walking in a pedestrian site. So they've done some um, as they it's evolved. They've used different sort of materials to to emphasize pedestrian priority and really give vehicles the sense that um, that they that, that they can they're allowed to go through. But it's definitely you know they're not they're not a priority. And there's just so many people in Barcelona too. I mean, we, we think about those videos that we saw. And I mean, there maybe there's a few other pictures. Maybe we should pull up some of the the uh, the, the photos of the before after, or maybe maybe if we can walk, walk through the evolution, because you asked about the first uh, site. Yeah, let's do the evolution. But before we do that, let's actually talk um, about the five rights to the city, because I think this is a good a good platform for for talking about this. Then we'll go through those the the slides that have the the evolution. Uh, of the different iterations, which is what you were just sort of alluding to. Walk us through these these five rights to the city and let me back this out so that we can actually see it. Boom, there we go. Yeah, so this is, this is um, so I can't lay claim to this. This is uh, one of the, the visionaries of the Superbox, uh, Salvador Rueda. Um, I recall seeing him just describe the five rights to the city back in 2000, maybe nine or so, um, when he still... Uh, he was working for the city's uh, ecology department, but he was, and he had been advancing the idea of the super block, but, but, but people really didn't listen to him very much. I guess the green party did. And, uh, and he, he emphasized how of the uh, five different rights to the city, the streets have been um, overrun by our, our right for mobility. That the fact that uh, m- m- most of the street space was, was devoted to mobility had, for, we, we've almost forgotten that we have all these other rights to the city, rights to for leisure and recreation, you know, for children to play, uh, the right to exchange or to develop, you know, have markets, um, the right for, for culture, right, and um, public art, and uh, which which Barcelona actually does really well, you know, public puppet shows and 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 theater, and also the, the right for for democratic expression and participation. Uh, which also in a, in a place with such great climate, it's also great to see whether it's a neighborhood uh, meeting or the, a school meeting, which are held in the streets. There's a lot of activities that Barcelona likes, residents like to do out in the streets. But if we give all the space to mobility and to, to vehicles, then we lose the opportunities to do all these other things. And so the idea is to, is to, is to balance our streets and uh, what we can do in them and certainly allow, allow for mobility uh, but just rebalance it with all these with our with our other rights. And what was what's been fascinating. I I grew up in California, but I have family here in Barcelona, so I've been able to follow the evolution of the the super block idea for for over a decade now. And it's been, it was uh, it was fascinating to see how something that was was a conceptual idea was eventually uh, imp- began to be seriously implemented in, in 2016 in, in the grid. And then to follow how the ideas evolved, and, and again, it's been it's been great to see how through different designs, uh, different tactics, this idea has been has been moving and moving forward in, in different ways. Uh, and what I what I'd like to do is give give folks a, a sense. If you can't come to Barcelona, like give them a bit of a sense that that it is changing, right? That they are they are trying to do different things and learning and learning from each iteration. You mentioned a couple things there um, that that I'll circle back around to. But it, at first, I just want to give a, a plug for uh, my my coffee mug here of streets are for people, <laughs> because these five things actually, you know, when when I when people ask me about my shirt, street, streets are for people, or my hat, streets are for people, my coffee mug, streets are for people, they say, what do you mean, and why do you have that declarative statement? Is as I say, look, streets have literally been around for thousands of years. And, you know, the interloper, the automobile, the mobility point on this five points, you know, is is something that has just kind of manifested itself through technology innovation over the last 120 years. What streets were for, we could, you know, change that title from the five rights to the city to, you know, the five things that what's what happened on streets before were, were the following. We had, you know exchange, cultural knowledge, expressions and participation, leisure in, in recreation, and oh yes, and also mobility. A lot of stuff happens on our streets. Uh, Chuck Marone from, from Strong Towns talks about streets being the platform for society, for wealth building. It's, it's where we come together or have traditionally come together over the years. And so, yeah, that's what I mean by that declarative statement that streets are for people because these five points 
you know, have a long legacy of happening. Exactly. Exactly. No, I could, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. And, and we need to redesign those, these spaces with, with these values and with these ideas in mind without a doubt. Yeah. And, and, and not to, to belabor this too much, but this is not a war on cars or the ability from a mobility perspective to get to meaningful destinations. You know, cars as a technology, they have their place. Obviously, we just don't need them to overwhelm and dominate. And it, it needs to be something. And we see this in societies, whether it's in the Netherlands or increasingly now in Barcelona and other other places where we're creating a healthier your balance versus, you know, the car dependency and the speed that then has a negative impact, you know, dating all the way back to what we were talking about earlier, like in the, in the Bay area, some of the early research that Donald Appleyard did on the negative consequences of fast moving traffic on sociability and, and, and the connectedness that people have with their neighbors. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that, that social connection is, is, um, is a great part of uh, living in a city with a Mediterranean climate. And, and California has that great climate and lots of cities, uh, you know, have, have, have the opportunities to, to do that. Yeah. Yeah. OK, let's get to that, that evolution that you wanted to talk about. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess this is a this is a slide that, that I, I developed to answer a lot of a lot of questions I, I get uh, you know, I get contacted by a lot of folks who are interested in learning about superblocks, and um, and I and, I, and when you put it on sort of a timeline, it, it, it makes a lot more sense, and you can see how how the city has evolved from more technical interventions and designs to more to more structural designs, um, and also they they also shifted away from that from that nine block model when they when they went to another part of the city, which was an important shift. But having seen it uh, developed, I think it was a really great a great move. Uh, because they were able to extend the idea of a of a, of a pedestrian priority street across the entire across the entire city, which is what you mentioned earlier of a, that three kilometer strip. Exactly, and so and, and in that way, that city residents in the grid could see what uh, if they didn't live on that street, they could see what their street could look like in the future, what the vision of the planners was. For the future of the of the city of the grid, or at least of the streets that are live in the grid, right? And maybe I'm getting to the end here, but there's a really the, the city planner um, Javi Matilla tells this really great story about the architectural team that was was responsible for designing that that new street design. I'm not, now going to skip here to the end, but I think it's a great story. And I want to I want to get it in there that that they that they really have a lot had a long term vision about what the future of the of the Barcelona would look like, what the future of the grid segment would look like. And, and they realized that they wouldn't be able to complete it all in the way that they wanted to, that they had a limited term, right? They had a couple of years. Um, and, and, they ta- and, and in that conversation, someone raised the idea of, uh, of what Antoni Gaudí did when he was building the Sagrada Familia. Of course, Antoni you know, Gaudí, great uh, Spanish Barcelona architect, he also knew that he wouldn't be able to finish the Sagrada Familia, this great cathedral, his life, his end of life um, masterpiece. And he feared that if he just did the footprint of the cathedral, he'd only get a few meters high and that a few meters high could easily be pushed over. And so in order to make sure that someone else could continue, uh, he built a full facade. He completed one the nativity scene. So it was raised and that way he knew other architects would complete the other, other ends. And that's what the Part of the reasons why uh, Javier Matin and his team shifted to doing an entire street that would cross the entire city and do it with structural, uh, complete, high quality materials because they knew they wouldn't be able to do the entire grid, but at least they would do a, a full segment with the high quality uh, intersections that were turned into to public squares with the hope that other other planners, other administrations would be able to complete the entire project uh, in the future. And I, and I think that was a smart move, even if they, you know, at the expense of abandoning the neighborhood unit approach, which, which, which thrust them to, the, you know, get them all of attention. And, and it shifts the, the, the notion of super blocks from blocks to streets. Right. Uh, it's really about rethinking the, the streets and, um, and creating these, these quality green spaces for, for people. Now you mentioned it earlier and you, you sort of alluded to it uh, right there as well, is that, 
there's a limited time aspect of it. And sometimes, and, and, and we've seen this also play out over the years that I've been following um, the experience down in Seville, sometimes uh, who's in power, who's in charge has a tremendous impact. So you, you mentioned earlier the Green Party was in charge, da, 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 da. Talk a little bit about that because, yeah, we, especially you know here in the United States right now, we're in a, an election season. Uh, this, uh, this particular episode is, is being recorded in October on the 10th, but we've got a huge election coming up the first week of, of November. This episode's coming out and the elections will be done here. But talk about that in terms of the, the, the challenges of being able to transform cities and the realities of, of changing administrations and changing political powers. Right. Well, Barcelona was was fortunate to have um, w- uh, a woman named Ada de Cura, who the Guardian called uh, w- uh, the world's most radical mayor, and her administration for for two terms. And I think that provided the opportunity for an influx of new ideas and to to, to help bring the super block to to reality. The the, tr- the current transition is uh, so she was not she was not reelected, and the, a, a, def- a more moderate party has taken taken hold. The hope the hope was that. The ideas behind the super block would be seen as as good for anyone and good for everyone, right? And not not politicized, but it, it has been politicized to some extent. And my hope is that after a period of some some distancing, which is I think we're we're going through now, that uh, it will just be self evident that this is a this is the type of city that we want to see and live in. I mean, we were thinking those those videos that that we that we saw, and, and maybe you can see some of the before and after. Uh, I think those before and after uh, images really, really speak for themselves. You know, we've, they've, they've, research has shown that residents overwhelmingly, uh, overwhelmingly like the transformation. They've also uh, seen traffic evaporation in streets that are not part of the super box. There you go, that's a before and after. You know, when you go now, it's hard to imagine the three lanes of traffic that went through that intersection. I mean, folks in Barcelona know <laughs> that that's what it was like. Uh, but 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 when and so I, I often take visitors to see a, a, a other intersections before just so they get the sense of what what it was like. Um, and again, for three kilometer stretch, it's pretty it's pretty traumatic. And I'm I'm glad you mentioned that too about hopefully this is self evident that this is beneficial to everyone. Uh, and that's kind of the point that I try to to make with active towns is that. In my mind, the way that I see the world, I see benefits across the political spectrum. Um, you know, especially my background in 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 behavior modification and, and public health. And you know, I cut my teeth the first fifteen years of my career was all about healthcare cost containment strategies. I'm trying to be fiscally conservative. I want to try to prevent as much that is preventable from happening happening, um, which should resonate across the political spectrum because you know it's like this is good for people. That's great. Yay! <laughs> it's also good for finance and good for money and and good for you know profit margins. You know, especially working with Fortune 500 companies the way that I did. Because they had a vested interest to try to prevent uh, a heart attack from happening because it hit their bottom line of profitability. They'd like to avoid that. That's good fiscal conservatism. Um, So anyways, I'm, I'm devastated when I see things get into these culture war types of situations and and realizing, no, 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 no. What I mean by active towns is this is good for everyone, regardless of where you're coming from, from a political belief perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I saw we had a a super block workshop with different researchers. And one of those who presented was from the business school. And he presented fantastic work showing how those businesses on the super block streets have done, have done much better um, and these Yelp reviews and also some statistical techniques to, to, you know, to get at these questions. So it was really encouraging to see that there's a, there's a strong business argument um, for, for changing these streets and making them more, more livable. So it's a health win, it's a green space win, it's a climate adaptation win, but it's also a, a business win for the local, for the local, uh, local sh- you know, shops and restaurants because uh, people enjoy strolling down those streets. It's, um, it's without a doubt is where is where you prefer to go on on a on a Saturday and Sunday afternoon. 
which is hey, which is good for business too. So from like, you know, from like, if there's anybody that should be like really, really supportive to trying to create more people-oriented places and streets that attract people, it should be the businesses in that area. Um, a, a lot of people like. They, they know my background as a public health professional, but they may not know that a third of my uh, coursework when I was, um, you know, you went to that other school on the East Coast, you know, the, the Michigan of the East. You went to Harvard and, and I was at the, at the University of Michigan in graduate school. And a third of my coursework was in the MBA program. There was a rationale from that because there was a compelling business, uh, you know, case for trying to create places that are better for people you know, at so many different levels. Um, so I want to pull up the, the, the workshop. The, we've got your, your, your Superblock Barcelona uh, research workshop. What is this all about? Well, this, was, this is just a reference of, you know, I have a couple slides here if, if the folks are interested in learning more. Uh, we did a workshop with researchers. Uh, it's on my blog where, where um, sort of basically the, the latest on Superblock uh, work is from a public health perspective, from the business perspective I just mentioned. Uh, we, there's a study on the traffic evaporation. This was just in, in this summer, um, and I hosted that at the Research Institute. And then if you keep going, there's a few other uh, resources. There's a, a book that's in English on Superbox built the, by the city that summarizes it very nicely. Um, so it's a resource, really. Um, I guess the, the go-to resource, it's not easy to find uh, if you search online. Um, so I wanted to provide folks with the, with the, with the link there so they could, they could see I'll it. I'll make sure that we include that in, uh, in the show notes for this episode. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a phenomenal book and, uh, but it's, it's not, not easy to find. So I wanted to, to make sure that folks could find it if they're, if they're interested in learning more about it. There's also an article that I, I, I did in the journal of public space that reviewed some of the, the super block, uh, research. Um, so that's, that's just another another resource uh, there. So here, you know, this is just within the last three years, right? So um, here you see a, a major traffic intersection and that same space has been turned into a, to a, a public garden, right? What you have here is the, the confluence of two uh, super block green axes. So you have the main one through which is three kilometers long and then another one, which is about a little bit over a kilometer long and they come perpendicularly. So when you have these two axes come together, you're, they're able to take over the entire intersection and turn it. There's a great, you know, child sort of play space there. <clears throat> this is definitely my favorite, my favorite one. And when I take, bring visitors, I, we always end here. But if unless you see that before photo, it's just hard to even imagine <laughs> what this place was like because just the change is just so dramatic. And it, and it shows that the Barcelona really needs to look at its intersections to create new green spaces um, because there, there's not a lot of land elsewhere. And that's that's the sort of that's what we'd like to be seeing in the next in the next few years more of these these green spaces created um, at the intersections. Two questions here for you: for the average resident in the Barcelona area, how popular has this trans transformation been? Yeah, I know it's been it's been unquestionably popular. We had we had a, a fellow named Samuel Nello who presented his work at the Superblock Research. Uh, he did um, he did some some high quality surveys with through a survey company he, did, he, he contracted out and they, there's unquestionably people are, are in favor residents are in favor of this of this transformation and even such there's still hesitancy with the with the city government and it's largely because they, they think they want to give some time to to distance themselves a little bit uh, politically from a project that the previous administration really took as as their own. So I'm still hopeful that we'll see that the, 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 the we'll see similar transformations, but we're still we're still waiting to see which direction the new the new city government or new city administration will will take us. My follow up question to the comment that you made earlier about how powerful it is to see the before and after is it seems like I, I'm I'm going to make an assumption here. Maybe this is an assumption that's wrong that there's not an image somewhere in each of these intersections that shows a picture, this picture before and after, or you don't even need the, 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 the before, or excuse me, you do need the before, but you don't need the after because they're standing in the after. It'd be great for, for folks to be reminded while they're in that space, what that space used to be like. Used to be like, yeah. 
that would be great, right? <laughs> I think that would be phenomenal because we we all know that we have these photos of of, of it being automobile focused and and you know choke full of cars and loud motorcycles. I mean, it, it's easy as humans we adapt so quickly to our changed environment, and then we forget so quickly how bad it used to be. And so being reminded, oh yeah, this looks, used to be like this, it also reinforces in people's minds, especially if they don't live in this area, maybe they live in the part of the city that hasn't had any transformations and they just have a really hard time believing that their intersection that's closest to them, that is a traffic sewer, could ever be transformed into this. But if they see that, oh, I recognize that lower picture in the intersection that's closest to my home. Maybe we could change this. That's exactly what's happening. That anyone else who lives in the grid says, hey, I would love for my street to look like this, right? Because it is a uniform grid. So, so the dimensions are the same. So when you walk down the green axis now, you, you see that you know, those dimensions are exactly the same in other places. And so you, you, you can see what the future of of the of the city may, may look like here's you see the tax you, you see the technical sort of step before the final intervention and, and maybe this is another important point the co- co- the covid pandemic was essential to um, allow this project to go ahead so quickly there were some um, there was some legislation that allowed for um, rapid transfers transformations in in uh, the public space so you know, going through, basically going through some technical hoops, and so the city took advantage of that, and um, went remove one and uh, start, began to remove lanes, uh, traffic lanes, and so they only had one lane, and they tested it out, see how it worked, and um, some of the political opposition criticized. Oh, we were just putting dropping plank down, and you know they even used some what we would call the, the New Jersey barriers here, so some you know, cement, and. Uh, and so they said, well, great. I'm glad you're criticizing it because let's go with the full structural design. And I think that was a really a great move. They had, they had um, you know, in, in 2020, they uh, they did tactical. They were able to confirm that the that the grid could withhold the, the, the traffic by removing lanes on those green axes. Uh, and then they went ahead and did the, the, the tactical uh Intervention and in fact, this this on the right here is is the very beginning of the one we just saw, and you can see with the vegetation grown out, it looks even much nicer. Uh, that was really the beginning. Uh, there it is. It looks much nicer. Yeah. And again, since this is the same intersection, and again, looking at the before <laughs> and how powerful that image really is in saying, hey. These streets that have we have allowed to become overrun with motor vehicles, they can change. They changed when they allowed motor vehicles to take over, and they can change again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's 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 really it's really inspiring, and and if you, I hope you have the chance to to one day come and visit, uh, because when you when you see it, uh, you're able to walk along these different streets and see, wow, this is um, really impressive impressive length of. Uh, uh, you know, just the scale and scope is uh, is, is is phenomenal. So, um, yeah, if, if anyone is interested in coming, there you go. This is a, a pro- I'll be running several programs in the um, in November, but also in May, I'll be running a one week program in Barcelona. If anyone is interested in in joining us, uh, we meet with the city planners that led this transformation. Last year, we met with the former mayor. Uh, we met with two city council members who were involved. Uh, local organizations, the the, um, the families that were part of the the school streets program and the um, you know fighting for safer cities, and so it's um, it's a great opportunity to connect uh, with uh, with the community that's been transforming the city and a source of great inspiration. So if anyone's interested, let they can uh, reach out to me, and uh, or for any other reason as well. There you go. There's our um, email uh, info at citylabdcn.org. We just started our, our Instagram account, City Lab Discovery. And if you follow us there, we'd be happy to connect. And also on the research side as well, I'm um, leading a research team uh, working on uh, cycling, a lot of work on cycling, some work on school streets as well. So I'm happy to connect with anyone who's interested on uh, to talk about that as well. It's Barcelona is a wonderful city to, to work on all these topics. It's really a lot of fun. And uh, it's, been, it's been great to, 
to connect with, with, to be the bridge between folks on both sides of the Atlantic. Yeah. Now you just mentioned something there in school streets. And I know some of the earliest uh, conversations that you and I had back and forth um, were related to the bike bus and the BC bus, uh, you know, channeling what you had mentioned earlier with Luke in, in being one of the early, um, you know, on the ground uh, instigators of the bike bus movement here in North America, there in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, and of course, the bike bus is, was huge. The BC bus was huge there in Barcelona. Uh, talk a little bit about, uh, you know, to close us out here uh, about sort of that status of, you know, that that movement, the BC bus movement. And then also more importantly, I think, is the school streets movement and really making permanent changes to the built environment so that kids can be free range kids so that they can get around to meaningful destinations uh, on their own. Yeah, well, Bike Bus has been a phenomenal, uh, phenomenal to watch. I have a PhD student, Gemma Simone, who's doing her PhD thesis on, on the Bike Bus. I'm a Bike Bus volunteer. Our kids actually don't ride Bike Bus because we walked we walk to school. It's too close. Yeah. yeah. Um, but we were but with uh, Sam Balto, who's in Portland, and uh, he came to Barcelona. We organized the first bike bus summit in Barcelona two years ago. In June, it was in Frankfurt. And then in um, this April, it will be in Worcester. And it will be April, I believe it's uh, 9th, 10th, and 11th in the UK. And Rob Collier is organizing it. I'd encourage anyone who's, who's connected with the bike bus uh, movement, if you're going to be in the UK in, in April, um, come join us. We'll, we'll be there. Uh, it's a it's a very it's an inspirational group of volunteers, and there's there's an interest in connecting and sharing stories. I've also in touch with the with the bike bus uh, organizer in Vancouver, and I know I know there are many uh, out there. With our student with Gemma, we did a global survey of uh, global bike bus. We looked at average distances, so the average different distance a bike bus will will move is about two two point seven kilometers. It seems like between two and three kilometers is the sweet spot of distance because it's too short. Then you walk, and if it's too long, it's too difficult for kids. Um, we're learning about the average age. We've noticed, for example, the bike bus uh, average age for kids is a little bit younger than what we might anticipate, which is really interesting because a lot of bike training um, goes to kids that are older, and a lot of bike research is on kids that are older. But yet the kids that are really enjoying and soaking up uh, the joy of bike bus are younger. And so I think we need to be thinking about, uh, in terms of cycle training, who, who, are, who our target audience is. And when you look at when you think about behavior change programs and what what are what are the elements needed, uh, you need they need to be uh, consistent in time, done over repeated. If it's social, done as a group, it needs to be experiential, right? You need to experience it. Bike bus has all those elements. It has all the elements of of really transforming how these kids think about uh, transportation. They'll never unlearn that experience of biking in the center of the street uh, with their families and friends. So I'm very excited about Bike Bus and look forward to doing more more work on that. So if anyone wants to connect with me about that. Well, and I like to say that uh, the Bike Bus is sort of one of those strategic little culture bomb things that can really help push cities um, to have some sense of urgency, getting back to that term, uh, to change their built environment. Because ultimately, and Sam Balto and I have talked about this before extensively, is that the ultimate goal is that we are able to create an environment where the kids can be doing this on their own. Yeah, you know, because that's absolutely. one of the things that, you know, when the Dutch see, you know, this with the Dutch, you know, with their mindset, they're like, yeah, you mean Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I mean, it's every day because the kids just naturally, you know, as they roll down the block, you know, the, their friends, you know, get on and they create. And I've video, I've, you know, created many videos that are like this where it's like, oh, wow, was that like a bike bus? And so, well, no, it's just a whole bunch of friends, you know, <laughs> it grows as they go down the block as they're they're heading to school and, and they're able to do that. That's the ultimate goal of this is that we're able to create that transformation it is that culture bomb sort of, uh, you know, if we want to use the term orange pill, <laughs> a little hat tip to, to Jason Slaughter at Not Just Bikes, uh, to try to you know change the mindset that it should be like this all the time. Yeah, exactly. We want to change our cities. Ultimately, we want children to be able to feel safe biking to school by themselves, and and have and if we can if we can have fun while we while we while we ask for that, then all the better. And, and bike bus has taken off because it has that 
fun element, but also has that activism element. Uh, it has a practical element. It brings together a lot of different, different, different reasons why to participate. Uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, no, I'd be. It, you yeah. mentioned school streets, so let's let's end with school streets. School streets, sure. So, um, so I participated. I was invited by the city of Barcelona to evaluate their the public use of public space outside their school streets. And as a researcher, I was still at the University of British Columbia when I when I was first invited. I did a lot of work on impact evaluation and, and planning, and and I and I, I asked them, "Are you are you do you really want a, a, an academic to evaluate?" Because you know I, I I really want to evaluate it using the you know. The highest standards of evaluation, and, and they they could, they said yes, absolutely. We, we we really want to know if this works. So we 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 decided to use uh, assess um, not only the schools that received the school streets interventions, but also comparable control streets, right? Because a before after inter- an assessment wouldn't be sufficient to really tease out the impact of the program. Um, and so for for each neighborhood school street, we we had a comparable control, which allowed us to do a, a difference in difference estimation on the impact of school streets in the use of public space. And we found increased uh, use in children play, more uh, age diversity, so more, uh, more, 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 more uh, girls playing, uh, age diversity, more elderly. And so we have really, really great, um, great outcomes. And I work with uh, Monica Balde and, and many others uh, at IS Global on that assessment. Um, we're still working on getting our, our papers out. Um, and our longest report is actually still in Catalan. So we need to get that out in English. We're connected with some of the the folks working on school streets elsewhere in, in Europe, notably Paris, of course. Right. But we're working to get that get that research out because we had a great we have a really great uh, and compelling design research design um, assessing that program. And one of the things that the, anyone who comes to Barcelona and joins our program, we we meet with the the, the uh, leaders of that of that uh, transformation. And in and in those cases, you really have. Uh, streets that are but that remove traffic entirely and uh, and so you, you see even uh, more bold well all sorts you know some are in full full closure but they also have sidewalk extensions and multiple treatments and uh, it's been an ex- it's also an exciting program we're also waiting to see where the where that where that program grows with goes with the new new administration we hope that it continues we know i'm part of the the network of families at schools and there's a big demand for um, for, for, for more of those programs. So we hope to see more of those soon as well. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned Paris uh, because that was one of the things that I was most impressed with this year in my return trip to Paris uh, was the to see some of the permanent street infrastructure transformations that took place under the school street program and and really that powerful transformation of that space i've had the opportunity to to look at and document a little bit sort of the temporary school street you know interventions that take place with volunteers you know on the day of the morning of school and and how they you know put some temporary stuff up to try to uh, decrease that through traffic of motor vehicles and divert motor vehicles away but it's completely different when you see a high quality, uh, you know, sort of like that final iteration of what the super blocks are looking like when you have really good high quality transformations of the public space of what used to be a traffic sewer, used to be a, a drop off and pick up a nightmare. Uh, and you see that space transformed into people oriented space, kid friendly space, uh, you know, I went by on a Sunday and a Saturday and saw the kids out shooting hoops and doing some fun stuff because it was an extension of their home, an extension of their school. It's a playground and it used to be a traffic sewer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and well, you know, in Barcelona, interestingly, Mike, you know, has done a lot of those really nice permanent designs. But what we're hearing from the new city is that they they might be thinking about. They, of course, they started with the easy streets, right? The streets have the least amount of traffic. Yeah. And so as we, you know, they're they're picking the low hanging fruit, and they're thinking they might be doing some temporary closure uh, designs, sort of like what the, those what the, they're doing in the UK. And so it'll be interesting to see what Barcelona's version of that modality might look like in the next uh, in the next administration. So so stay tuned for for more for more school streets here, we hope. 
Well, and you just mentioned the UK, so I want to uh, also emphasize too that you know some of the strategies that they're implementing, uh, especially in the 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 London, in some of the London borough areas, there is this concept of combining the school street uh, with the low traffic neighborhood sort of concept of you know let's let's kind of transform some of these spaces and get some of these traffic diverters, bringing down the the volume of motor vehicles throughout the entire area, not just in the block you know, surrounding the schools, because that's one of the biggest things that, that, you know, I talk about is, hey, let's transform entire communities into active towns, into places where all ages and abilities can get about. And then just like we were referencing with the, the bike bus, you know, we can create an environment where, you know, all ages and abilities across the entire spectrum of age and also physical abilities can be able to, you know, get around in their in their cities and feel welcome in that environment. Yeah, of course, that's absolutely the, the ultimate goal. And as long as we don't have that, we'll still we'll still be, you know, you know, pushing for it. And, and bike bus is a fun way to to help make sure that we get, you know, super block designs on all the city, all the city streets. Yeah. But yeah, ultimately we want we want kids to be autonomous and to feel safe and parents to let them let them roam and, and enjoy the city with the same rights that, that we have. Yeah. Yeah. And for, for those of you who, who don't have kids, uh, maybe you just never had kids or you've you the kids are out of the house. Uh, it's OK. You could do, a, a, you know, a bike bus uh, with a whole bunch of friends. Uh, one of the recent interviews that I did was with uh, Laura Mitchell in. Minneapolis. And, you know, she shared some great photos of like entire groups of families getting together to to roll down some of the infrastructure to get to a cafe to, to have dinner. And so, yeah, it's there's a, a, a lot of power in a whole bunch of people getting together to roll down and really activating the infrastructure that's in place, as well as, you know, calling, you know, know, setting up that that expectation for the leaders of the cities that, hey, this is something that is truly appreciated by the constituency and and elections do matter. And you know what? We need to start, you know, we need to start listening to this community because they seem to want all this people friendly places. They seem to want streets for people. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. There, you said you use the word power, but there's this energy, right? When you get, when you get people moving on a, on a bike together or you know, walking together, there's just, there's this energy of all being there using the, the, the cycling infrastructure that, that, uh, yeah, that's wonderful. And then when it's with kids, it's, it's even all the more wonderful because, because they're, they're in the center of the street and they're with their friends and they're laughing and, you know, the, the city is theirs. It's just so I, I would say, I would say the same thing also for the elderly, too. If you can yeah. have all generations there and yes. you, you, you've but got some better. people who may be in mobility devices mm-hmm. and wheelchairs, the, they absolutely. light up. There's so much fun because of that power, that energy, because the, the word that you used uh, and we've used a couple of times is fun and joy. Yes, exactly. Yeah, Sam Balto says it's uh, the bike bus is like certain... Uh, surfing a wave of joy, right? It's like, it's just, you're just, it's just wonderful. And you're all moving together. Well, I'm going to see uh, Sam in, in just a couple of weeks at the uh, Safe Routes uh, Partnership Conference in Fort Collins, Colorado. So uh, I will be sure to mention to him when I see him that we had this wonderful conversation. Uh, Jordy, thank you so very much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. This has been so much fun. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me. And uh, I appreciate the work you're doing to to get all this, uh, all these insights and uh, knowledge out there. So thank you for, for having me, uh, letting me join you. Hey everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Jordy. And if you did, please hey, give it a thumbs up, leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring that notifications bell. And if you're enjoying this content here on the Active Towns channel, please consider supporting my efforts by becoming an Active Towns ambassador. It's easy to do. Just head on over to activetowns.org and click on the support tab. And by the way, Patreon supporters do get early and ad-free access to all this video content. Again, thank you so much for tuning in. It really does mean so much to me. And until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers.
And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me a Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.